last lecture, we saw how Napoleon, as the consul and then as the emperor, tried to reorganize uh, France uh, socially, administratively, and politically. Uh, we also tried to see if, in the process, he inaugurated a new social order, which was at least partly based on what the revolution achieved. Today, we would like to look at how Napoleon reorganized the large part of Europe that he conquered through war at different points of time. If there is one consistent theme about Napoleon, once he was in power, it was his unceasing war that characterized the entire period from 1799 to 1815. <laughs> Napoleon had known that he will have to ensure peace at the front by bringing the war which had resumed to a successful conclusion. This was a sine qua non to ensure peace and stability at home as well. On his return from Napoleon uh, from Egypt, Napoleon found that the second coalition had been formed and the conquest in Italy that he had made in 1796 uh, was in the process of being undone. France uh, had to abandon Naples and Rome and therefore Napoleon decided to invade Italy once more in 1800. France occupied Piedmont, the Cisalpine Republic was restored, the Austrians were defeated at Marengo. Uh, and then at Hohenlinden. The war was brought to a close by the Treaty of Lunéville in 1800. France's boundary was advanced to the Rhine. The Holy Roman Empire recognized the Batavian and the Helvetic Republics in Holland and uh, Switzerland. Only Great Britain was now ranged against uh, <coughs> France. In 1802, Napoleon uh, made peace even with Britain. Uh, the peace of Amiya. This was, however, a mere truce caused by war weariness than an enduring treaty that was likely to guarantee peace. After the conclusion of the war in 1800, Napoleon devoted a lot of his energy to the internal reorganization, but he was also active on the external front in uh, Europe. War was renewed in 1803-4, but in the meantime, Napoleon uh, had been active in Italy. He annexed Piedmont and became the president of the Cisalpine Republic. The Swiss uh, Confederation now replaced the old Helvetic Republic and the Confederation was in close alliance to France. The western part of the Holy Roman Empire was reorganized in Germany. French troops entered the Batavian Republic. And all this came as a rather disturbing news to Britain. The war with Britain was resumed and it necessarily took the form of a naval war. France had Spain as an ally, but the French and Spanish fleets were virtually destroyed by Nelson in the celebrated Battle of Trafalgar of the coast of Portugal in 1845. Now the defeat at Trafalgar was some kind of a shattering blow to Napoleon's position and it, it showed his Achilles' heel, that is his enduring weakness in so far as sea power was concerned. Britain's superiority here was underlined and we shall see later that Napoleon had to have resort to other kind of warfare in order to circumvent Britain's superiority in naval power. But the land war continued. Napoleon decided to once again move against uh, Austria. He came via the southern route, moved into Austria. General Mack, the Austrian general, was in Bavaria waiting for the Russians. Napoleon attacked General Mack at Ulm and defeated him in the battle there. 
General Mack was obliged to surrender with about 50,000 men. Then after a hurried march, Napoleon entered Vienna. The Russians and Austrians had in the meantime managed to join forces together and had masked their soldiers at a place called Austerlitz, a little away from Vienna. This is where now Napoleon marched. He had 73,000 men against the combined strength of more than 87,000 of the Austrians and the Russians. And at Austerlitz, Napoleon won arguably his most famous victory. It was his speed that mattered and the new strategy that he had employed. He had stretched the flanks by trying to attack them from both sides. And when the center was weakened through a column formation, he attacked the center. Ocelitz saw a brilliant application of Napoleon's new strategy and the allies uh, uh, Russians and the Austrian forces were absolutely annihilated. Now this gave Napoleon the opportunity to reorganize once more. And now we see that Napoleon was taking a final leave from the Repub Republican and Revolutionary tradition. He ended the republics, converted them into kingdoms and made them part of the French Empire, the Grand Empire of Napoleon, as it would soon be known. In Naples, he created a kingdom placed under his brother Joseph. The old Republic of Italy would now be the Kingdom of Italy, of which Napoleon became the king, and Eugene de Beauharnais, his stepson, became the viceroy. Uh, in Holland, the Batavian Republic became the Kingdom of Holland, which was placed under his brother Louis. He also reorganized the western part of the Holy Roman Empire and here we have finally the Holy Roman Empire, which had lasted for more than 1000 years, coming to an end. Napoleon ended the faction of the Holy Roman Empire and here he started a new, new kind of political a configuration which came to be known as the Confederation of the Rhine. From Mecklenburg in the north to Tyrol in the south, the uh, small kingdoms or, or states, 16, later 18, were united in this Confederation of the Rhine. This is what Napoleon gained after winning his famous victory over Austro-Russian forces and through the Treaty of Pressburg. Then Napoleon decided to move against Prussia. Prussia had now allied with Russia. With Britain, the war, naval war had ended in disaster, but Britain was still not in the continent to fight the war with their old allies. Napoleon defeated the Prussians at the another famous battle of Jena, entered Berlin. And it is from Berlin that he started his uh, continental blockade when he uh, started uh, the economic warfare with England. And after the conquest of Berlin, he created yet another new uh, kingdom, the Kingdom of Westphalia, where he combined some of the parts which uh, states or regions which he received from Prussia. The Kingdom of Westphalia was placed under yet another brother, Jerome. And then Napoleon moved against Russia as well. First, there was the Battle of Eilau, which was bloody but indecisive. But he managed to defeat the Russians in the Battle of Friedland, and the result was the Treaty of Tilsit. Thereby, the Tsar of Russia, Alexander I, agreed to have an a treaty with uh, Napoleon. He agreed to join the continental system. The Prussian part of Poland was now constituted into the, into the Grand Duchy of Warsaw. So this is where Napoleon stood supreme in Europe. He had several satellite kingdoms. The republics were gone. The kingdoms were under his brothers and other relatives, which indicated a dynastic ambition that Napoleon was obviously harboring all the time. 
Now, how did he reorganize this? We've seen he had conquered, he had converted the republics into kingdoms, barring Switzerland, where the old Helvetic Republic was made into a confederation, closely allied to France, of course. There are also the independent kingdoms like Bavaria, Baden, Utenberg, which were ruled by their rulers, but were very close to France and received obvious impact of French rule or, or even new ideas that Napoleon continued from the revolution. Now the basic reorganization then was reconstituting the ter conquered territories into satellite kingdoms. But the major point was how or what did Napoleon do in these conquered areas? What kind of reform did Napoleon introduce into these conquered areas? Napoleon wished to introduce a similar kind of uh, administrative and economic order in the states beyond France. Some historians feel that Napoleon did not have any consistent policy with regard to the conquered areas. There are other historians who had suggested that Napoleon not only reorganized uh, Europe in a, in a purely territorial sense, but he had introduced the ideas of the revolution through his reforms. And the reforms necessarily came in the shape of the Code Napoleon. The Code Napoleon, in a way, was the container through which Napoleon brought new ideas and reforms into these uh, territories. Now, it was clear that when the French had issued the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, they were not declaring the rights of Frenchmen only, but of all men. Now, this universal principle, which was incorporated largely into the new codes that Napoleon made, if brought or transported to Europe would have been likely to germinate new ideas. Among them could be ideas of nationality or kind of national consciousness. What did it do? There, there was an attack on feudalism everywhere. The old feudal entails were, were destroyed. New uh, administrative and bureaucratic organization were introduced. Some of these areas were directly under French rule, they had the impact of the French prefectural system, became part of the French military divisions, and received the impact, the full impact of the uh, civil, uh, legal, administrative uh, reforms which were introduced in France. Napoleon was very clear about some of these things. For example, he wrote to his brother Jerome, who was the ruler of Westphalia, I quote, The benefits of the Code Napoleon, legal procedure in open court, the jury, are the points by which your monarchy must be distinguished. Your people must enjoy a liberty and equality unknown in the rest of Germany, unquote. To Joseph he wrote, you must establish the civil code in your state, it will justify your power. Since by it all entails are cancelled and there will be no longer any great estates apart from those you create yourself. This is the motive which has led me to recommend a civil code and to introduce it everywhere. Napoleon's motives were quite cynical. He wanted to introduce the court to buttress his own power. In fact, Napoleon wanted to introduce the same kind of uh, institutions and social order in the Grand Empire that he had introduced in his own uh, regime, in his own empire in, in France. He meant to introduce the system of government to confirm his rule. He wanted all intermediary bodies to go. He wanted feudalism to go. He wanted legal civil equality. 
He wanted career open to talent. Now through this, he wanted to enlist the support in the vassal states. And that would be the social base of the power that he would enjoy there. The part On the part of the Grand Empire, or the states in the Grand Empire, they had one obligation. They had to keep supplying the emperor with men and money. This is why Lefebvre has said, I'm quoting, the expansion of French institutions was one of the forms assumed by his lust for power. The traditional view would have, as I noted earlier, credited Napoleon with a, a whole lot of positive influences over the conquered uh, territories. It has been uh, uh, said that indirectly at least Napoleon's uh, impact did create an embryonic form of uh, national consciousness in regions like Germany and Italy. That uh, a degree of rationalization and quote-unquote modernization of administration had been introduced in Germany and Mutatis Mutandis in Italy as well. It is under the impact of this that gradually change was coming into these regions and there was the beginning of a break with the Ashia regime even here. It is possible to suggest a second point that as Napoleon's conquests were reconstituted into new kingdoms, as the introduction of reforms led to change, there was also a negative feeling against the increasing way in which Napoleon's rule became imperialistic. The way these areas and their resources and even men were used for the benefits of France, for pursuing Napoleon's policy of almost relentless war. But at any rate, this uh, traditional view had somewhat been uh, challenged by many recent uh, studies on the impact of Napoleon, particularly in Germany and Italy. Jeffrey Ellis in his Napoleonic Empire had tried to understand this problem by dividing the conquered areas into different categories. So the first category would be the Pei Reuni or the areas which had been directly integrated into the French Empire. For example, France, we had seen earlier, had 83 departments. Now, the enlarged territory gave France 130 departments. So, there was a substantial expansion of, of power. These areas were brought within the prefectural system. For these departments were governed by the prefects appointed directly by the uh, emperor. First the consul and then the uh, emperor. They also became part of the 25th and 26th military divisions of the empire. As a result, these areas were exposed for a longer period to the impact of the code and other reforms that he had introduced. In this, uh, in Germany, one would include the lands to the west of the Rhine. In Italy, it was Piedmont, the Ligurian coast, Savoy and Nice. These were areas which are pei re uni. The second would be pei conqui or the countries or the areas conquered. These were territories which were conquered and then reconstituted into separate kingdoms as we have seen mostly under Napoleon's brothers or relatives. Here we have uh, for example uh, the kingdom of Italy which Napoleon ruled himself. Boharne was the viceroy. Later, of course, after he had a son, uh, he would be the uh, king of Rome. Naples was put under his brother Joseph, but when Joseph was 
brought to Spain. It went to Mura, who was his close associate and general, but also his brother-in-law. Westphalia was given to Jerome. Holland was under Louis. There was another area, Belgium, which had been under France virtually since 1795. And there the impact was large. Now in these conquered areas, reforms were introduced and we had seen Napoleon exhorted even his brothers to actually introduce reforms, particularly the code, which would subsume their rule. But as we have seen, the basic motive was to exploit the resources in this region for the overarching policies that Napoleon uh, made himself. The third category would be the pays alliés or the allied kingdoms. In this we have, we had noted them earlier, the kingdoms of Bavaria, Baden, Utenberg or the Grand Duchy of Berg. To some extent even the Grand Duchy of Warsaw which was placed under the ruler of Saxony. Saxony was included in this. Here there was an influence of the French reforms but they were deep in some areas were a little superficial in other areas. It is possible to ask if these attempts by Napoleon to introduce these codes and the reforms to all these regions did reform the existing institutions in these areas. Whether in fact Napoleon succeeded in rationalizing or modernizing as they say our legal, social and economic institutions in the subject states. It is also important to know how far Napoleon was hamstrung by his military and dynastic needs from carrying these reforms to their logical conclusions? Or to what extent did he have to make certain pragmatic compromises with the old feudalistic elements in these uh, regions? Now there is no doubt that Napoleon uh, introduced or Napoleonic rule introduced changes here. We might uh, look at some of these uh, points that the recent studies have made, that by 1814 the left bank of the Rhine, the Piedmont Liguria had experienced uh, important institutional changes through the formal assimilation to French rule. Belgium may also be included in this category. There was sale of church property, they were part of the military divisions, there was a prefectural system. There were also the other ancillary reforms, for example, treasury inspect inspectorates, chambers of commerce, trade tribunals, grain markets, bridges and highways, mining divisions, industrial arbitration councils, and the whole apparatus of civil and criminal courts in the imperial university. There are many others. Now, in the annexed land, there is a debate about which way the scale til tilted. Uh, was it exploitation or material advantage? But what is important, these studies argue, is the element of continuity that was still there. That within the evolving social and professional elites in the uh, annexed territories, there had sometimes been a little conservative impact of the French rule as well. Now, this from uh, say roughly 1800 to 1807-8, Napoleon had succeeded in reconquering, uh, conquering and reconstituting good part of Europe, introducing his reforms there. The question that these recent studies has, uh, have asked is, if Napoleon's reforms had acquired deeper roots everywhere, then it would have been probably a little difficult to restore in 1815 after his uh, defeat. The victorious allies had abandoned the compromise that Napoleon had started. And Germany and Poland, at any rate, 
witnessed a tilting of balance in favor of the old princes. Jeffrey Ellis has suggested that Napoleon should not be seen as a radical social reformer wherever he intervened. Now, his argument is based on the fact that had the roots been deeper, the work of uh, the makers of Vienna Congress would have been more difficult. A second point that he makes is that even so far as change was concerned, there had been a beginning even before. In conclusion, we might suggest that Napoleon's uh, uh, impact worked two ways. A, there had been an introduction of certain basic principles of the revolution, particularly through the Code Napoleon. Feudalism was attacked, if not destroyed, everywhere. Civil liberty, legal equality had been sought to be introduced. There was, of course, no liberty. Administrative rationalization, a certain degree of bureaucratization, and uh, modern, modern uh, state or, or kind of uh, modern state, as one witnesses in France, had been sought to be introduced in these regions as, uh, uh, as well. So there had been uh, an impact which germinated through the next decades. Secondly, there was also the negative impact. The way Napoleon used these territories, the revolutionary ideas, the revolution's impact notwithstanding, to simply serve his imperial interest, had militated against his rule. And there was in the process uh, at least an emergence of the creation of an other, that Napoleon was the other and therefore we are different. And uh, Italian poet Leopardi had mentioned this, talking of the Grand Army where Napoleon recruited people from all these conquered areas. He said how unfortunate is it is for one to die in a foreign country fighting for a foreign country. He was talking of Italian soldiers fighting with the French army and dying in Spain, fighting for France. Now it is in this we have the evocation of a new consciousness, which was in an embryonic form, but it is possible to suggest that Napoleonic rule, uh, Napoleonic reorganization, Napoleonic conquest had also uh, produced that kind of evocation. We shall in the next uh, uh, lecture see the decline of Napoleon and there, there we will be able to uh, substantiate uh, this last point that we are making here. But overall, there is no doubt that Napoleon did stand like a colossus uh, through the first decade of the 19th century over the whole of Europe.